we are the first generation of humans smart enough to build machines more intelligent than we are. The first generation that can do that. We're also the first generation stupid enough to actually do it. And yours is the generation that's going to have to live with this shit. You all are the generation that's going to have to grow up with these machines. You all are the generation that's going to have to figure out a lot of social issue with these machines. So this talk, for however long I go on, thanks for the build-up, man. Set expectations. <laughs> we are going to figure this out. We're going to understand what exactly you guys have to expect out of all this. So, this is the story of the future. This is the story of your all's future. And I am going to talk about all the things that you need to know for this future. Because I don't care if you're technical, I don't care if you're a business student, actually, I'm sorry, technical people, I prefer that. Technical people have done enough to fuck up this world, thank you. We need a few other people thinking about this. And here's the first thing you need to know, that you're not going to program the machines of the future, you're going to train them. AI is different from any other software that we have ever built. You don't code it, you train it, right? Think about when you learn to drive or if you've ever taught someone else to drive. You didn't program them to drive a car. You didn't say, okay, if you see this little, you know, octagonal thing, if you see this hexagon, it says stop on you, fucking stop, and, and you do this and it on every single case you turn right. That's not what you did. What you did is you took them out driving. And you said, oh, okay, you just made a mistake there. Don't do that again. When you see that kind of situation, do this other thing instead. You didn't program them to drive, you trained them to drive. Machines think just like we do. That's what AI is all about. It's not about if this, then this, else do this other thing. That's not how you program AI. You don't program AI, you train it. We need to get used to talking about this. First time I trained in AI was, I was a graduate student at the University of Tennessee and we got a contract from the Federal Bureau of Investigation to do fingerprint recognition. And as soon as I saw this, 5,000 images came in from 5,000 images of fingerprints. Some of them were the same person, some of them were different people. And I'm thinking, what do I do, right? How do I write a, if the fingerprint looks fucking like this? then that means it's the same, and you can't do it. What, do you do? what you do is you show them a whole bunch of fingerprints. These are all from the same people. This is called supervised learning or supervised training. All these fingerprints are the same digit of the same individual, and a machine figures out the patterns, just like you did when your mom or your dad taught you how to drive, right? You go out, you get a whole bunch of samples, and you learn from it. That's what the machines did with the fingerprints. That's what the machines do with cats. Did you all know that cats were the first thing? Why is it always cats? There's more pictures of cats on the internet than there is of your all's junk. And you all are really good at putting pictures of your junk up on the internet. But you can't beat the cats! So how do you train an algorithm? You give it a bunch of pictures of cats, and you give it a bunch of pictures of camels, and you give it a bunch of pictures of dogs, and you give it a bunch of pictures of humans, and you tell it which ones are the cats, and it figures out the patterns. That's the key. It figures out the patterns, and sometimes you don't even know how it figured it out. Is it the geometry of the nose? Is it the, the triangle that represents the nose, the eye to the ear? What is it? The math figures it out. The machine figures it out. AI are, are, are stochastic processes, mathematical structures that work just like the human brain. You don't know how you learn to recognize a cat from a dog, do you? And yet every single one of you all can represent, r recognize a cat from a dog. We don't know how the machines do it either. They do it just like us. That's the first thing you need to know. Stop talking about programming. Start thinking about training. 
And the more data you have to train it with, the more pictures of cats, the more pictures of fingerprints, the more little details you have, the faster the machines learn. Second thing you need to understand is that this is all about data. Data is what drives this. Data is the lifeblood. Without data, without pictures of cats, without pictures of fingerprints, without pictures of, of, of scans of cancer patients, you don't have enough data to train the algorithm. The algorithm has only seen 1,000 cats. It's not going to be very good at recognizing cats. The algorithm has seen 10 million cats. It's going to be really good at recognizing cats. Data is the new oil. And everything reduces to data. Everything. You have data, you have wealth, and everything is data. Thanks to, so I, I live in uh, uh, the U.S. and in the U.K. I, so, so to me, you know, you, talk, you were dissing Brexit. Brexit? Trump? Doesn't, doesn't look so bad now, does it? It's my escape plan. Everything reduces to data. It's all data. And England is a surveillance state. We got a lot of data. We have cameras everywhere in England. CCTV in operation here. You know, I've never seen a, the, the, the absence of one of those signs. CCTV, we know where you are, we know where you're going. It's all a bunch of data. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to see if I can do this. I'm going to see if I can reduce a problem I have to data. And so I decided my hot tub. What a first world problem this is, right? The whole idea was, can I reduce this to data so that, that the, the machine, the hot tub itself, can maintain itself? Because it's a pain in the ass, right? I've got to test the water for chemical imbalance. I've got to add chemicals. I've got to buy chemicals from Amazon. I've got to worry about all this shit. Let me see if I can train this machine to do it, reduce it to data. So the first thing I did is I found a bunch of sensors. And here is one of these, these sibling technologies to AI. It's called IoT, the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things are a bunch of sensors that collect data. Cities are collecting data. Your house is collecting data. It's not going to be too long until your house knows whether there are any people in it, who those people are, what those people are doing, which room they're in, how long they've been there, and what they've touched, because they're all going to be sensors. So I, I bought this sensor. The sensor cost me 39 US dollars, which is basically like five cents in euros, real money. And I installed it, and it tracks the water quality. All those things I need, right? Water hardness, alkalinity, pH, and chlorine. Tracks all that shit. It's collecting data every second. It's got tons and tons and tons of data. And then I will add chemicals. So I start, see, I'm not programming it. I didn't program my machine. I'm like, if the fucking chlorine is this, then add this. I didn't do any of that. I just put chlorine in, and the machine noticed. Hey, when that chlorine level got high, he didn't put any chlorine in. When the chlorine level got low, he put chlorine in. And it figured out what the level was. I didn't have to tell it. You're not programming this shit. We actually have a chance to build a world without the fucking nerds. It just observes on the data. And then, so I put a bunch of chemicals in, put a bunch of chemicals in, and it began to notice the patterns. And then I bought another piece of hardware that injects the chemicals for me. It cost about 99 US. And so now it does it, right? It sees the chlorine gets low, it puts chlorine in. It sees the water, and it started noticing the patterns. One of the patterns that it noticed is that alkalinity, the second one on that list, that's the one you got to do first. Now, it learned that from me. It watched. Every time the alkalinity was off, I fixed it first because I know as a human, if the, if the alkalinity is off, you can't fix the other shit. It just it bounces all over the place. It learned that wisdom from me. And then it learned water hardness, calcium, is the second thing. It learned that sequence. I didn't have to program that. It learned it by observing its, its human expert. It noticed that whenever I injected bromine or chlorine, I opened the lid of the hot tub first because it's got to burn off all that organic material. It's got the hot tub, it sticks, it's gross. 
It noticed that. And so I had a little motor for it to open the, the lid. It will open the lid. Freaks out the people in the backyard. It's kind of cool. It's like it, it opens it and it starts injecting chemicals. And people are like, what the fuck is going on? And so it's working for me. It's crazy. All this stuff, is, all this labor that I used to have to do, less than $200 worth of hardware and IoT stuff, and it's doing it for me. I reduced maintenance of a hot tub to data. Maintenance of a home is going to be reduced to data. Maintenance of a city will be reduced to data. We'll talk about that in a minute. And one day I'm in my hot tub, and I'm sitting there, and, and all of a sudden the water gets cloudy, and I realize, oh, shit, it's, it's, it's just injected a bunch of chlorine into the water. Why did it pick now? Because it didn't know a human was in it. See, this is one thing we're going to have to get used to with the machines. There's going to be places where we just kind of forget. By the way, chlorine is really, really bad for the human body. It's really bad, especially for men. Um, hormonally, chlorine really messes with people who have external, you know, things. And so I'm like, I'm getting out of it, and I'm washing off. I'm like, ah, ah, God, gross, gross, gross. And I realized it doesn't have the data. It doesn't know. This is a sensor it doesn't have. So I bought one, $19. This sensor cost me. It's a moisture detector, right? So I sit in the hot tub, because you've got to think about it, right? This is, this is really the design issue for us humans. How does my hot tub know whether there's a human in it? Well, you've got to reduce that equation to data. What data shows that a human is in? And I thought, oh, I could badge in, but I thought, oh, how geeky that is. Oh, no, don't get in the hot tub. You've got to badge in. $19 sensor. You sit, water level rises, and the sensor detects the water level rise. And then there's some cool shit that happened. Right? I got in, and the water level rose. My daughter got in. She's not as big as me. The water level doesn't rise as high. So I see this in the data. So I go to back into supervised training mode. I'm like, you know, that's me. That's my daughter. That's my son. And, and it begins to figure shit out. So now it knows. It tells me, hey, your daughter's in the hot tub. I got, I got one time I was, uh, I, was, I was, in fact, I was in Amsterdam. I, I, was tra I was traveling on a business. I was in Amsterdam, and I get this alert from my hot tub. My hot tub's like, dude, 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 dude. It calls me dude. Dude, 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 there's 300 pounds of human flesh in me. It calls you human flesh if it hasn't learned your name. And I'm thinking, 300 pounds, who, who's, who do I know who's 300 pounds? This is bothering me. I, why did I not install a camera? I thought about it, but it seemed kind of creepy. And so I thought, who, who is this? Who is this? Who is? Well, maybe it's two people. Uh-oh. I subtract my daughter's weight from 305, and I got Dylan. <laughs> if it had been 10 pounds lighter, it had been Kevin. Fine with that scenario. Dylan, not a fan. So here I am, 4,000 miles away from my hot tub. Dylan's in it with my daughter. I mean, what do I have? I didn't design an anti-Dylan mechanism for this. So I thought, you know what? The only thing I can do... <laughs> hey, I'll tell you, right now, I give up all Father of the Year awards for fucking ever. I close the lid on those bitches. <laughs> About five minutes later, I get a text from my daughter. She's like, dang, 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 your hot tub's going crazy. And I said, no, sweetheart. You triggered the chastity protection feature <laughs> of my hot tub. She hasn't been in it since. See, all these things kind of rolled out of it. Like, I told it one day, I thought, wait a minute, I'm displacing water. My daughter's displacing less. My son is displacing a little bit more than her, but less than me. What if I give it our weights? You know, I weigh 180 pounds, and my daughter weighs 120 pounds, and my son weighs 150 pounds. And then it started estimating the people who got in with me. So I'm like tempting people into my hot tub. A friend of mine was over, and she's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, hey, you know, hot tub sounds kind of nice. 
And she's like, no, I don't want, oh, come on. Anyhow, I coaxed her in, right? She's like putting her, she's like, oh, you get in first. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You get in first, right? I got my, I got my app here. I'm looking at And she gets in, and then I realize, shit, I got to ask her how much she weighs. <laughs> now, I don't know about in Holland, but that's not polite conversation in the U.S. So my app's like, she weighs 135 pounds, and I'm like, um, um, have you been working out? Right, like, because you're looking really fit. You, you must be like, I don't know, 130, less than 130. Guys, <laughs> always guess low. It makes it a lot less douchey. You must, and she's like, oh, well, yeah, I haven't, yeah, I'm probably, I'm probably a little bit less than 130. And I'm thinking, bullshit, you're lying. <laughs> You're 135, and she's not the only one. I just told you I was 180. Total lie, I'm 185. And, and so all of this stuff, you begin to reduce these problems to data, and the algorithms start solving the problems for you. Hot tub's next. Your house is after that, and the cities are after that, to the point where every bar is going to know it's a bar. They're going to know what the rotating taps are. Every restaurant's going to know what soup of the day is. They're going to know what tables are free. They're going to know what bands are playing. And they are going to help you decide what to do tonight. The next thing you need to know is that the data isn't enough, right? Let's think about oil. Oil's really valuable, right? If I offered you 10,000 gallons of oil, would that be of value to you? Not really. What's really valuable is the energy you extract from oil. If I offered you, you know, electricity for 10 years, that would be valuable to you. The oil, not so much. Same with data. The real value is in the extraction of knowledge from the data, and that's what every single one of you all are going to be doing for your careers for the next 30 years. You are going to be the refineries of data. You are going to be the ones asking the right questions about data, making the right insights about data, and sitting next to an AI and training it to understand the data. That's going to be your job. I don't care if you work for a bank. I don't care if you work for a law firm. I don't care if you work for a tech firm. I don't even care if you work for an oil company. That's what you're going to be doing, extracting knowledge from it. And, and that's different, right? So have you seen this movie? The World War Z now, in, in, if I was in England, I'd have to call it World War Z, because for some reason the Brits like to put a D on the end of what's really one single fucking letter. I'm just saying, Z's enough. World War Z. So I'm with, I'm with, I met this movie with my date. She was looking so forward to this movie, because in this movie about zombies, which are fucking awesome, is this guy. She's kind of a fan. He has a shirtless scene in this movie. And she was just like, I mean, she couldn't take her eyes off the screen. She's like, holy shit, it's going to disrobe at any moment. And, and, and I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm in it for the zombies. But then something weird happened. About halfway through the movie, she's like, oh, I'll be right back. And she, she, she runs out of the movie theater. And I'm back in my seat like, what the fuck? She left this movie, he hadn't taken his shirt off yet. This could happen at any moment. She better get back quick, because if she misses this shit, I'm going to have to describe it to her. That's not right. I have enough body image issues without having to compare myself to that asshole. Luckily, four minutes later, she comes back from wherever she went. She plops down, and she just carries on watching the movie like she'd never left. And I turned to her and I said, oh my gosh, you were lucky. You didn't miss anything. And she said, yeah, I know. And she showed me her phone. She's got an app that tells her when to pee at the movies. <laughs> How many of you all go to the movies? Raise your hand if you go to the movies. All of us, right? How many of you all urinate? <laughs> How many of you all have this app? Here we have a room full of movie-going urinators, and not a single one of you all have the knowledge of this app. See, that's the difference between data and knowledge. 
This app is out there and you don't have it. Why? Because we don't yet live in this smart future. In the future, as soon as you walk into the movie theater, the AI is already watching. Everybody watch movies. Everybody, whatever they do, whatever app they're running, and they see this app, and all of a sudden you think, or you even, may even vocalize, I gotta go. And then, boom, wait five minutes. There's a four-minute P interval where nothing really happens. That's the difference between data and knowledge. Raw data or the ability to use it. Twitter. You could do this with Facebook if you'd like to be evil. You could do it with Twitter if you'd like to be evil. Twitter. Here's what I want you to start thinking. What if an AI was watching me tweet? What if an AI was watching all of us tweet? That's not hard for an AI. AIs don't get tired. They don't get distracted. They don't get hungry. They don't have to pee. Traveling to Boston and New York next week, any locals who can hook me up with some good live music recommendations? You don't think a machine will understand that? Type that into Google right now and you'll see the machines already do understand that. Oh, you're looking for live music venues in Boston and New York. Next week, I can compute that. I know when you're going to be there. I know what you're looking for. Can I help? So instead of just tweeting at each other, because that's what this tweet did. This tweet went to the people who follow me. You're welcome to follow me on Twitter. If I don't say something really funny within the first week of you following me, please unfollow me. And, and, and unfollow me with some noise, right? You asshole thing. Kind of something like that, right? But what if an AI had control of Twitter? You're telling me an AI couldn't say, oh, music venues in Boston and New York. Well, hell, there's a whole bunch of them right here. And in fact, I wrote the code for it. There's about 2,500 Twitter accounts that claim to be live music venues in Boston and New York. Don't you think they'd be better recipients of this tweet than the people who follow me who are clearly unhelpful? They favorited this tweet. If this is your favorite tweet on Twitter, get the fuck off of Twitter, man. There's nothing for you there. But what if it took this tweet and sent it to those 2,500? Well, I decided to find out. I wrote a little code to send this tweet to all 2,500 accounts with location equal Boston or New York and something about live music in their feed. And I got instant gratification. Now, AI would do better. See, my little program wasn't AI because I programmed it. I didn't train it. Ideally, it would know a little bit about me. Ideally, it would know that that first recommendation of jazz music is never going to fly with me. I don't like jazz. And I'm sorry if you do. And I'm sorry if you're annoyed with my dislike of jazz music because it's not just a small dislike. It's actual sadness to see the high quality musicianship that exists within jazz music and to have to listen to them play that shit. So that wouldn't be, right? Because my AI would be like, oh, jazz. No, 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 no. Not for James. And the second one is the symphony, classical music, sounding a bit better since we legalized weed. But I'm not yet high enough. I and mean, you can imagine what the interface might be, you know, left swipe that shit. And the third one shocked me to the core. The third one, Cage the Elephant. My favorite fucking band is playing in Boston while I'm there. Are you kidding me? Now that's data to knowledge. That's something useful. Hey, James, did you know that you're going to be in Boston the same time that your favorite band is playing? Tickets are still available. Would you like me to buy them for you? Yes, please. Done. See how AI can make our lives a lot simpler, a lot better. next thing you need to learn is that there will be no UI. Me saying, yes, please, is enough for me to get tickets to that show. Yes, please. You see, user interfaces, user interfaces are kind of bullshit. User interfaces, we invented them so that we could tell the fucking computers what we wanted them to do. 
We didn't have a way of communicating with a computer. So we're like, all right, here's a keyboard. And here's a mouse. And here's a little screen that we can scroll and swipe and fucking tap and walk out in traffic while we're staring at. This is input and output from the real world to the machine world. That's what a user interface is all about. But machines think and see, thanks to IoT, like we do. They don't need a UI. So the very first thing, if you want to do something useful tonight, every time you pick up your phone and launch an app, say, how would I do this without the UI? That's what the business leaders of the next generation are already asking themselves. I'll give you two UI components, voice. Machines understand what we say. Siri, Cortana, Google Now, Alexa, all of these. They're nearly as good at it as we are, and they're, they're going to do nothing but get better at recognizing language. So you get voice, and you get gestures. Because that's exactly how I'm communicating to you right now. That's how humans communicate. We talk, and we give gestures, right? That's all you get, and that's all that's going to happen in the future. So this kind of bullshit? Are you kidding me? So my kids are, are half British and half American, so they've got dual pass. Right now they've got European passports. Ah, oh, man. Anyway, so we, we do Christmas in both. So, so a common question, right, is, hey, Dad, where, where are we going to spend Christmas this year? Can we go to Europe? And, and, and so... <laughs> A little simple question. Why can't I just ask my machine how much would it cost to take my family to Christmas, to Europe for Christmas this year? What's so hard about that? My family. That's something my AI should know. Who am I related to? Who lives in my house with me? Who generally travels to Europe with me as my plus one and plus two and whatever? That's data. Christmas. What the fuck? You're going to ask me, oh, I want to go on December 15th. Oh, shit, that's too expensive. How about December 16th? Figure this shit out. The one that really pisses me off is, okay, where do you want to start this trip? The data is pretty clear on that. 98% of my tickets, I bought my, my mom a ticket. Every year I buy her a ticket from Louisville to Seattle so she'd come visit me. Other than that, all of my trips start in Seattle. That's the data. And then just go for the, just for shits and grins, just click Europe on the destination and see what it says. Oh, there's no Europe airport. <laughs> Do you want to go to Liechtenstein? I, I don't know. Figure your shit out. There's nothing that a machine can't do. Right? So I, I did this, and I, my, my daughter's like, oh, I want to go. I want to go to Europe. I want to go to Europe. I was, All right, we're going to Europe. And so I wrote a little code for this just to figure it out. Right? I just basically ingested all of the flight data of flights that have actually been purchased that originate in Seattle and end somewhere in the nearly 1,000 airports in Europe. And it's a gob of data, but my AI doesn't care. It goes through it. What's the cheapest place? Guess what, the cheap, guess what it told me? This is five minutes worth of AI work. The cheapest place for me to go from Seattle to Europe during Christmas is Lisbon, Portugal. So I told, I told my daughter, I was like, we're going to Lisbon. And she's like, that's in Portugal, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty good, an American with geography skills. Yeah. <laughs> Raising that chick right. And I said, yeah, it's in Portugal. And she's like, I don't want to go to Portugal. I'm like, well, why don't you want to go to Portugal? And she said, I'm Cristiano Ronaldo's Portuguese, and I hate that fucker. I'm like, that's not a reason to not go to Portugal. So she's like, oh, I want to go to the, you know, those German Christmas markets. I want to go to a town that's got one of those German Christmas markets. So I'm like, shit. Guess what? All the German Christmas markets and all the cities in Europe, that's data. So I added that to the equation, told the AI to pay attention to that. So guess what? The highest uh, rated German Christmas market in what town that's also the cheapest to fly to from Seattle? Take a guess. Manchester, England. <laughs> we live right outside of Manchester. Crazy, but that's the data. You're going to be talking. The, the one I like is, honey, what do you want to do tonight? I mean, how often do you get that with your significant other? Honey, what do you want to do tonight? And what does she, he always say? I don't know. 
<laughs> what do you want to do tonight? Smart Cities is going to turn that into data. You're going to know what bands are playing. You're going to know what specials there are. You're going to be know, know where the people are. The other part of this UI is pretty interesting, and that, that's where augmented and virtual reality come into. So, so already AI's got a, some siblings and cousins that we need to know about. IoT was one I've already talked about. Augmented and virtual reality are the others. And augmented reality specifically is pretty cool because it negates the need for UI. What we do in augmented reality, augmented and virtual reality are kind of ends of the, the two ends of the same spectrum, right? So, so on, the, on the augmented reality side, the idea is to take digital assets, things that are normally stored in the computer, and bring them into the real world, right? No screens, no keyboards, no mice. Take what's on the computer and bring it into my world, right? Pokemon Go. It's called augmented reality because some of it is reality. Right? You're looking at the Pokemon, you're playing Pokemon Go, and you're, through the camera you're seeing reality. But you're also seeing that little fucking Pokemon. I don't really know, I don't play this game. I have never poked them on before. I don't know what it's all about, but you see the little thing there, right? That's the thing that's augmented. That's the fake thing. That's the digital thing. What we're doing is we're blending aspects of the digital world with aspects of the real world. No UI. They exist in our world. Now, Pokemon on your screen is one thing. These are actual holograms that appear to be real. And it's pretty cool the way holograms work. They trick the brain into seeing shit, right? Like if I'm looking at you, do you understand how, the, how the, the, this is a sensor? I don't see anything with my eyes. My eyes collect light, so when I look at you, I see light shining off you, right? My eyes are collecting the light that's shining off of her. And, and my brain is taking that data and interpreting it. Like, that's what she looks like. That's how far away she is. That's how that right, movement, all that shit, right? I am right now a, an image inside your head. Your head has figured out how to make it look like it looks. With holograms, we hijack that process. Instead of collecting light at the eye, we shine the light on the several lenses. And if you look at, you know, HoloLens and all these AR glasses, Magic Leap, and all, there's, there's layers and layers and layers of different materials. There's coatings, and they absorb light in different ways so that we can put them on, and the eye sees that, those different light patterns, and the brain sees it, right? So what they've done is they've just with a gesture, pulled the heart out of this person. How do they know what the heart looks like? Well, it was scanned before the body went in for uh, uh, its surgery. And they pull the heart out, and they spin it around, and they discuss it, and then they put it back in. It settles in, and they can see the veins. They can see the various chambers. They're not going to miss a cut. Same thing happens, right? If you ever put on a hollow lens, we have this image where a dragon flies out at you. It's a wyvern. Sorry, but those... Animals in the Game of Thrones are not dragons. They're wyverns. And if you played D&D, &D, if they had one person that played D&D &D on that fucking show, they'd know this shit. It's a wyvern. But anyhow, when that dragon flies at you, you're going to duck because you're convinced it's real because it's the same brain mechanism seeing the hologram that see images in real life, right? Now, the opposite of that is virtual reality. In augmented reality, we bring digital assets into the real world. In virtual reality, we bring physical assets into the virtual world. Right, this is an image of uh, Mars. Uh, about 13% of Mars has been committed to virtual landscape. It's really Mars, right? It's Mars reduced to data. And that data interpreted through a visual, uh, virtual reality headset. And then these are, image, these are us, right? And these are going to get better and better and better. Just Moore's Law made computers faster and more memory and all that stuff for the last 30 years. Same thing's going to happen with this. It's going to get more. The, the difference between your, your avatar and the real you is going to diminish over the next 20 years or so. And we'll be able to wander Mars together. You want to go? All right? We can go to Westeros. We can go to Middle Earth. We can go to medieval England. Um, we can go to Rotterdam, what it looked like 
before the bombs fell in the 40s and walk those streets. Somebody simply has to take those landscapes and reduce them to data. That is going to be your task over the next, over the, the rest of your career, is reducing high value problems to data. Almost finished. Now all this knowledge is cumulative, right? It's not just a single machine that's getting smarter. Self-driving cars. We've taught cars to drive, we've trained them to drive, we haven't programmed them to drive. Left turn wasn't programmed. Left turn was demonstrated and a machine learned it. And, and they're a lot better at it than we are because they execute perfectly. We get distracted, we look at our phones, we, we put on our makeup, we eat Big Macs while we're driving. Seemed like a good idea at the time. And they don't. Humans kill about one person worldwide every second in cars. Self-driving cars have killed one person. Only one. Tragedy. Awful tragedy. But the thing about machines is they learn from that. The, 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 the minutes leading up to that death, or in, in, even if it's just a crash where no one dies, is data. And that data is shared with every single self-driving car in the fleet so that they all know immediately, if you see data that looks like this, I can stop, man. Something bad's going to happen. Have you ever seen videos of self-driving cars and traffic jams? You know how when, if it's all human driving, there's a traffic jam, right? You're like, oh, shit, traffic jam. And then, and then the traffic jam clears, and the first car goes. And then there's a delay, and the second car goes. And then the third car, some douche is looking at his phone, right? He's like, oh, shit, and then he goes. And the traffic jam's still there two hours later, even though not self-driving cars all move simultaneously because they're talking to each other. They know one's moved. They say, hey, we're moving, we're moving at this speed, go. And they all do it together. We don't do that as humans. We don't have this collective knowledge. When we're driving, there's basically only one gesture we have to communicate with any other driver on the road. The machines talk constantly. They're perfect at it. <laughs> so they're going to be good at not just driving. Already machines are practicing a thousand different kinds of law. If there's a silver lining in all of this shit, it's that the lawyers are going to be some of the first bastards to go, man. Be some of the first bell ends that lose their job. That's a good British one. Only the Brits laughed at that one. AI is outperforming lawyers across the board. Why? Because law is just nothing but data. Books of data, case precedents of data, legislation is data. It's all data. Machines are going to be really freaking good at it. If I sue you, your lawyer's going to be like, shit, sick to find out every case that's like this where the defense wins. And the machines are going to figure out your defense and you're not going to need a defense attorney. In fact, the machines are going to figure out, you know what, you can't sue. Here is the resolution that has established precedent. And we won't need lawyers. We won't need politicians. Okay. AI is going to become more and more like us because it's not just computer science that's doing this. It's material science. We already have, we already have uh, material that mimics human skin so accurately that they did a study where, where people were blindfolded and they felt up a, a real human and they felt up a, a mannequin with this special skin and measured arousal. And it was the same. Westworld, right? The neuroscientists are, are reducing brain patterns to data. The Human Brain Project. We're going to figure out how we think, why we think that way. We're going to discover the parts of the brain that have depression and anxiety and all these other things. The machines are going to become more and more like us as we learn more and more about ourselves. It's not just our speech. It's not just our grammar. It's not just our handwriting. It's not just our communication. They are going to be able to mimic us. And when they become just like us, 
then what do we do? What will be our job? In, in what circumstances will we be better than the machines? Some people say, oh, it's going to be love. Human emotions. You don't think the machines can learn love? Now, I'm not sure that the machines can feel love. But they're going to learn it. That's data. And they're going to fake it better than any human you've ever been with. They're going to learn what compassion looks like. They may or may not feel that compassion. But if they're taking care of your grandmother or grandfather in their dotage, they're not going to get tired. They're not going to steal their money. They're not going to abuse them. They're going to make better doctors. The one place that we have that the machines seem to be really bad at is creativity, art, music. Entertainment. Can we reduce that to data? Because that's really the question. If you reduce that to data, the machines are going to be great at it. So where is all this going? Well, that's anybody's guess. I'm going to live to see a lot of it. You're going to live to see all of it. And my parting message to you is that you can control this. You all are going to be the generation that's going to decide, do we need a robot bill of rights? Your all's generation is going to decide, are we going to just rope some shit off and say, this is what humanity's all about? The machines can't play here? Nobody's allowed to reduce this to data? Because this is our heart and this is our soul and this is our humanity? You all are the ones that get to decide. You all are the ones that are going to get to decide how all this plays out. How fast we go, what laws we pass. What's right and what's wrong. And I'm glad that there's a lot of non-tech people here. I'm glad that there's a... I lecture at two universities, Lancaster University in England and the University of Washington in Seattle both in business schools. We cannot let the nerds win this one. You saw what they did with social. You saw what they did with the web. You saw the buggy shit that my company put out in the 90s. Don't let them have it. Don't let some billionaire nerd decide your future for you. It's yours. It's your generation's. And the more of you all who understand these things, the more of you all who are thinking about these things, the more of you all who follow me on Twitter, <laughs> the better off the world is going to be. My name is James Whitaker. Peace, everybody. Peace.